Welcome. I'm Sebastian Mafud, and you're listening to WCAT Radio, the on-air wing of En Route Books and Media, bringing you the dulcet sounds of Catholic wisdom. Hello, and welcome to another edition of St. Paul's Letters to America. My name is Ray Gerard. I'm your host for this program, and along with me today is my good friend Jeff, who's going to sit in and uh, provide feedback, tell me everything that I say is wrong. Uh, But this is the program that raises the question, what if St. Paul were alive today? What if he were here to write a letter to America? What would he say? Well, this is the program where you will also hear exactly what he would say. We know the answer to the question we just asked. Because we know that he would say exactly what he wrote in his letters to the people in the Mediterranean world 2,000 years ago. His letters are as timely today as they were then. Because they, like all scripture, express timeless truths. If not, they will not stand up when we attempt to apply them to modern situations. And here, that is exactly what we do. Here, we take an issue that is current in our lives and our society today and look at it through the prism of St. Paul's writings. Often we talk about two things people say never to talk about at the same time, religion and politics. We compare the wisdom of the day to the wisdom of a man named Paul from 2,000 years ago who knew nothing of our modern world and our modern problems to see if, nonetheless, He has answers that can be of use to us today. And as we do, we always bear our motto in mind, love and kindness through the light of truth. Hopefully, that is what we do here. Now today, what we're going to be talking about is a law, a new law that's being proposed in the state of California. Uh, This is uh, a wonderful little law. And uh, it follows, actually, some events that took place in Australia last year. Some folks there decided um, that because of the sexual abuse scandal in the Catholic priesthood, that they also investigated and looked into, that they should make a change in their law. And what they thought would be a good idea was that, well, we know that there are all these, that, that, that priests hear confessions. And we know that sometimes priests hear confessions about people who have committed sexual abuse. And so we're going to compel people under the pain of criminal penalties to report to the authorities what they've heard in the confessional booth. The Catholic Church in Australia had a little bit of a different view to this proposal. They didn't necessarily agree to it. For example, the um, Archbishop of Adelaide which is in the district of South Australia, which is one of the um, states in Australia that passed such a law, said that politicians can change the law, but we can't change the nature of the confessional, which is a sacred encounter between a penitent and someone seeking forgiveness and a priest representing Christ. But nonetheless, this is the law in a lot of places in Australia. And following that, just this past week, just this past Wednesday, as a matter of fact, a legislator in California, in the state Senate there in California, has proposed a similar law. It has been written into the law in California that a number of certain people are required by law, they're mandated by law, to report incidents of secular abuse if they encounter them, teachers, doctors, and so forth. Priests are included on that list. But the law includes a special exemption for priests. The new law that was proposed just this past Wednesday would eliminate that exception. So how are we to react to such a proposal? What is the, I mean, what is, what is the way in which we should look at it? Is this a good law? Does it have merit? Are there, are there things to be said in favor of the law? Would it in fact be useful in you know, attempts by the church to combat sexual abuse, or would it not? Well, for some perspective, we turn to a letter from St. Paul. And in this one particular letter he writes, it's actually his second letter to the Corinthians, from chapter 5, he writes, 
From now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even if we once knew Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him so no longer. So whoever is in Christ is a new creation. The old things have passed away. Behold, new things have come, and all this is from God, who has reconciled us to himself through Christ and given us the ministry of reconciliation. Namely, God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. So we are ambassadors for Christ, as if God were appealing through us. That was St. Paul writing about the ministry of reconciliation. A ministry that was created on the uh, evening of the first day of the week. This comes from uh, the Gospel of John, chapter 20. It's on the evening of that first day of the week when the doors were locked, when the disciples were for fear of the Jews, where, where the disciples were for fear of the Jews. Jesus came and stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus again said to them, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit, whose sins, are forgive, whose sins you forgive are forgiven, and those sins you retain are retained. So on the first day of the week, when the resurrection was was just was was was, was just something that was, was so new to the disciples, and the doors were locked. What does he do? He comes in. The first thing he says to them is peace, and then the very next thing, as the Father has sent me, so I send you. Here he is. Now, just having been resurrected, the disciples. Are so are so happy. They're so joyous to see him. And what does he do? He immediately gives them a mission. Yes, it's time to celebrate, but you also have a job to do, and let's be about doing it. As as he has sent me, so now I send you. And then what did he do? He breathed on them the Holy Spirit, and immediately then, the very next thing he says is, "Whose sins you forgive are forgiven." He gives them a job. He gives them what Saint Paul refers to as the Ministry of Reconciliation. No small thing. I mean, this... And I I recount a familiar story for you. Simply to point up something that might not be in the minds of our legislators who are considering laws like this. What might not be in the forefront of their thinking is the direct connection with the almighty God that exists in the confessional. It is the reason why the church has said that it will not obey with laws of this nature. It is why a certain father, Whelan, who uh, is a parish priest at St. Patrick's Church in Sydney, Australia, and he was quoted in the local news as saying that he, along with other priests, would be, quote, willing to go to jail, close quote, rather than break the seal of the confession. When asked if the church was above the law, reading from an article in an Australian newspaper, when asked if the church was above the law, Whelan said, absolutely not, and said he would only be protecting religious freedom. Religious freedom, not above the law. The church doesn't put itself out there as being above the law. But the law still has to recognize religious freedom. The law has to make a place for God. This ministry of reconciliation was created by Christ himself. It establishes really a, a sacrosanct union between believers and their, their God. So this is obviously a very, 
very serious issue. And it's at the forefront of things in our culture today because the scandal is so prominent. So, as the function of this show is to consider the words of St. Paul, what can we take from this letter from St. Paul? What can we take from that letter that will help us look at this particular issue? Well, first off, St. Paul talks about the fact that we are flesh no longer. Flesh no longer. What's he talking about? I'm sure, Jeff, you have, you know, I mean, but you, I know because you, you've talked to me about this before, the fact that we are new people in Christ. People who are now believers um, are not relegated. Their lives are not governed solely by uh, human desires, human thinking, the the, the things of, of this world, the concerns of this world. We are new people in Christ. We have put on Christ. We are in the flesh no longer. We live, we live for God. We live with the spiritual connection to God. It is that spiritual connection. I mean, Paul talks about, in leading up to this, this, this reference to the ministry of reconciliation, this is what St. Paul is talking about. He's talking about this direct connection to God, having put on Christ, being new people, new creations, not of the old sort. There's a whole new, blessed, deep, profound dimension to living our lives in this way. And it is directly connected to the ministry of reconciliation. We have to reconcile people to God. What does St. Paul talk about? He talks about not counting the trespasses. That is the joy, the relief, the the, the tremendous you know uh, uh, feelings of of oneness that can come when sins are honestly forgiven, with an honest intention to avoid sin again. And what about the priest? Who is he in this in this in this little uh, dialogue? I mean, you have the penitent on one hand, but you then have the priest on the other. Now, God is present, but the priest is there as well. He's the tool, as if God were appealing through us. There is a direct, God is appealing in the confessional booth to the penitents. He's appealing to them to seek his mercy. He's appealing to them to do that through the priest. You can't hear the words of God. He's present but he's not going to be speaking to us in a human voice. That human that human voice is the priest's. And he's not going to be speaking to us. God's not going to speak to us in a human voice of his own. But he's going to be speaking to us through the human voice of the priest. That's, that's how we hear him. This is the sacred connection that exists in the confessional booth. We have um, the catechism of the Catholic Church that talks about this such a great deal and in the the catechism it number one for the priest you know it it poses well it it imposes a severe responsibility on the priests uh, number 1467 in the catechism it says given the delicacy and greatness of this ministry and the respect due to persons the church declares that every priest who hears confessions is bound under very severe penalties to keep absolute secrecy regarding the sins that his penitents have confessed to him. He can make no use of knowledge that confession gives him about penitents' lives. This secret, which, which admits of no exceptions, is called the sacramental seal because what the penitent has made known to the priest remains sealed by the sacrament. Sealed by the sacrament. Now those sound like nice words. I mean, you look at the sacrament, and I, if you talk to most priests, I've always uh, had a concern about you know what that is confessed, because that which is confessed is you redeemed. But when the priest is acting in persona Christi, you will talk to most priests. They don't remember the confessions or the the routine, because the Holy Spirit speaks through them as a compassionate, loving father and a loving brother to help them become a realize the, what their sins are and the way they need to transform their lives to become better imitators of Christ, if I can use that 
to become better people, to realize where they need to turn away from their sin. So I I have a hard time, or I am not able to figure out how there would be a an ownership if a penitent comes in to a priest, how they can remember a confession when most of them that you talk to is they are acting in the loving Creator of Christ. Sure, of course. Well, uh, there's a uh, there's a, <clears throat> a priest. His name is uh, <clears throat> Father Landry, and Father Landry has written on this. Now, Father Landry is a priest of the Diocese of Fall River in Massachusetts. He also works uh, on the um, uh, well, there's a, a mission to the United Nations from the Vatican. So there's a, it's like an envoy. Uh, the church is represented, representative to the Vatican. He works uh, he works with that group as well. Um, he uh, is uh, the chaplain for Catholic Voices USA. He's appeared on he writes for the Na- National Catholic Register. Appeared on a lot of national radio programs and and the like. So uh, he is used to commenting on uh, social issues uh, of a national in a national context and of national importance. At any rate, Father Landry, last summer, in response to these uh, efforts that were taking place in Australia, wrote about this. And he talked um, in some ways about what you were talking about yourself, Jeff. Um, What he said was, number one, he said, you know, a lot of times the priest isn't going to remember, isn't going to know who it was, who was telling him a particular uh, sin of sexual abuse simply because the confessional is anonymous. People might come in, he's not going to know. A priest won't know the person other, often enough, won't know the person on the other side of the confessional screen. You have a lot of times people who might confess a sin like this, maybe wanting to go to a different church than their normal church, if they even go to church normally, um, and, and seek out a priest who doesn't recognize their voice. That's certainly possible. Um, you know, you can have instances where people may decide not to come to confession altogether. They may, knowing that they're at risk for being reported to the police, they may choose simply not to confess this sin. You know, you know, I've, I've been to confession in many churches in California, and the one thing that it's always prevalent is the amount of individuals that are there in the line. Um, I've seen times when there's 50 to 60 just in line at some of the churches. St. Sophia is one that brings up the mind, and Sacred Heart in Coronado is another in Imperial Beach. Is you have a lot of denominations that are really looking for their own suffering and poverty. And, and when I when I talk to you know, some of the priests or the fathers after that, they come out they come out exhausted. Um, it's not that they um, don't have a concern for each. They take their time out for each and they'll. You know, penitent and and try to advise them on the best way that the Holy Spirit sees fit. But for them to single out an individual, that is a task that I can never see being accomplished. Sure. If 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 you're hearing a long list of confessions and you've got one confession mixed in among 20 or 30, now naturally a serious transgression like sexual abuse of a minor, for example, is going to stick out. But you're not going to be able, if you've got... 20 or 30 people that you're in the midst of hearing their confessions, you're not going to be able to jump out of the confessional booth, open the door, and look around to see who was the last guy who came into your booth, came into the booth. Um, to say nothing of the fact that I'm sure that's a violation in and of itself. Um, you know, so there, you know, there are many reasons why this kind of a law may not be effective. Um, another thing Father Landry mentions is if people are discouraged from confessing, what you're really doing is losing an opportunity for a priest to help a penitent. A priest might say, I mean, I think the law came about in Australia because there are instances where uh, some people, you know, reported over and over and over again the same sin, and the priest just kept it secret. And wouldn't there be a... So in that case... Would it have been better if the priest involved who was hearing the same sin over and over and over again go to that penitent and say, I'm not going to give you absolution this time. You have to make some reparation. You have to heal yourself. You have to do... And that was common, in the, for example, in the early days of the church. People had to go severe penance, undergo severe penances 
Take Padre Pio, for example. He would tell he would tell people, "No, you're not serious about this, you know, because you're not confessing all your you're sins, not, or you're not coming here with a sincere heart." You left heart. this one out. You, you left that one out. Huh? There was a well, there was a there was an actress, a famous actress, who came to him one time to confess, and she had like a little entourage behind her, and she was making a show. Aren't I? Aren't I very devout? Aren't I very pious? I'm going to confession with Padre Pio. And he told her to get out. <laughs> he told her, I, 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 I think a part of this that I'm, we're not really becoming aware of, is we don't know what goes on in the confessional. So how do we know that if an individual comes in and is penitent about a manslaughter or a sexual abuse, that that priest in the confessional or that persona Christi isn't advising that you need to come clean with this or you need to go to the authorities or you need to... to Become responsible or accountable, or if something you did or and or didn't do, there's we have no way of knowing that. So the priest and those confessionals could actually be doing their job and helping someone that is sorry for a, a crime or a sin or something they had committed. And the priest on the other side has said, "You need to do the right thing and and make amends." Or and sure. we don't know these things. It's it's kind of like uh, I guess um, I can't think of an example right now of. When you're really doing the right thing, but if it became public knowledge, then once again it would be counterintuitive. I can't think of one like that. But oh, well, Father Landry has, okay. for example, he brought up the he brought up the possibility that a priest might get accused of violating this particular law and not reporting something that was confessed to him, and the priest may be enjoined from defending himself because he won't relate what happened in the confessional. That's Called pre casing. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yes. and, uh, that, that's another possible that's, that's another, you know, making an accusation of something that did not occur or did not happen. There's a there's a lot of uh subjectivity I think in this and it's you know, but I mean, uh just to to, to keep <laughs> keep quoting Father Landry because some of what he says is so good. Um he brought up some very interesting cases in history and some were not that long ago. Um cases in history where a priest was willing to die, and in fact cases where priests did die, rather than obey civil authorities and the demand to report what was said in a confessional. And why are priests, and have certain priests been willing to do this? Because of where we started with this discussion. Because the, the fact is that this is now a direct connection, what you are trying to interfere with, is a direct means of communication between a believer and their God. You are interfering, potentially, with the salvation of a soul. If priests have to report what is said in the confessional, and if somebody is discouraged from going to the confessional, maybe they come to a confessional, maybe they go to a priest that, you know, is not going to know them, Maybe they uh, report the sin without specific details so that perhaps they can get an absolution that will be effective even though they don't describe who, what, and when, and so on and so forth. Um, but maybe there are others who are not. Maybe there are others who, not wanting to go to a confession in the first place, not wanting to have to report something like this, feeling the guilt and shame that comes with it, finding it hard enough, to communicate this verbally to another human being, now all of a sudden I get discouraged even more because there's a chance that someone might see them going into the confessional or who knows what. Um, and, uh, you know, so this is this is extremely serious because if a sin then is not reported, but the catechism of the church, the... The you know the, the the repository of years of thinking and study and so forth with regard to all of these beliefs of ours, it describes the effects of confession and what's so important about it. And what the Catechism says is that reconciliation anticipates in a certain way the judgment judgment to which a penitent would be subjected at the end of his earthly life. For it is now in this life that we are offered the choice between life and death. I, it, this was surprising. The church actually, the catechism actually says this. 
in this life, we are offered the choice between life and death. We would think that perhaps that choice comes at our point of death. We finally get the, the choice between eternal life and, and death. We the choice between heaven or hell, the choice between God or the devil. But no, it's in this life that we act out that choice. And it is only, the Catechism continues, it is only by the road of conversion that we can enter the kingdom from which one is excluded by grave sin. And by the way, there, and of course, when you read the Catechism, the footnotes, there's always multi, these footnotes that refer to multiple references in the in the Bible or other oh, authorities. You know, I mean, this <clears throat> these are not just statements that come out of the blue. So it is only by conversion that we can enter the kingdom from which one is excluded by grave sin. In converting to Christ, converting to Christ through penance and faith, the sinner passes from death to life and does not come into judgment. This is why priests have been willing to die. When you tell a priest that he has to disobey his vows to keep this secret, you are potentially interfering with the salvation of a soul. Earthly authorities can threaten what they like, but you render unto the earthly authorities what belongs to them, and you render unto God what belongs to him. Souls belong to God. And um, if you think that this is just talk, and the priests, while they may verbalize some bravery about being willing to die, but maybe it's not true that you know push comes to shove, maybe they might not. Well, I'm going to go back to my, my authority, the one that I've been leaning yeah. on so much. Father, Father Landry gives us examples. There's an, an old one, St. John uh, Nepomuk. He was the confessor of Queen Johanna. Uh, she, he, she was the wife of Wenceslaus IV of Bohemia. And uh, the king thought his wife was unfaithful, wanted uh, St. John to relate what she had told him in the confessional. He refused. Then, after various attempts, none of which worked, the king ordered that uh, Father John be bound, thrown off, thrown off the Charles Bridge in Prague, and drowned. And that's what happened. Now, hundreds of years ago. Okay, fine. How about a little bit more recent? How about 1927 in Mexico? St. Mateo Carrera Magellanes was killed for refusing to tell General Eugenio Uregio, messing up that name, Ortiz, what condemned prisoners had confessed. After he rejected the general's order to break the seal, Ortiz put a gun to the side of Father Carrera's head when the priest responded, he can do that, but a priest has to guard the seal of the confession. I am ready to die. Ortiz ordered that he be brought to the outskirts of Durango and shot. So the general didn't have, I guess, the internal stamina to do the dirty deed himself, but he still had the priest shot. During the Spanish Civil War, two priests died protecting the seal. Blessed Philippe uh, Kiscar Puig heard the confession of a Franciscan friar about to be executed by firing squad in Valencia in 1936. Soldiers demanded that he had, that he divulge what the friar had told him. Father Kiska refused, saying, "Do what you want, but I will not reveal the confession. I would die before that." He was executed, and there was another priest executed uh, along with him. Um, so these are just some examples, uh, but this is, in the eyes of the Church, extremely serious, and in the the hearts of the priests, extremely serious, so serious that not only have our priests been willing to die, but they have died. Now these days, priests are getting a very bad rap. You know, some priests, if you look at the statistics, you know, over a 50, 60 year period, 70 year period in Pennsylvania, something like around four or Four percent. I think in certain decades it might be as much as seven percent. 
uh, of priests are, are guilty of, of you know some sexual abuse or at least being accused of it. I shouldn't say guilty of it. Um, there are some numbers in Australia that are similar. So you've, and the reports are that these numbers are not any higher than in a lot of the society today, whether they're public schools or you know other organizations, that it's not really any higher than anybody else, be that as it may. There are some priests who have committed atrocious acts. There are some bishops who have failed to take proper action, who, I don't know, do you... You know, bear the same guilt, bear more guilt. Uh, you know, not you be the judge. Better yet, let God be the judge. Um, but there are some bishops that are guilty of atrocious acts in allowing priests who are known to be transgressors to continue to mingle with young children and so forth, um, and, have, and have enabled more acts. Uh, that have destroyed lives of, of of people. So there are, to be sure, uh, definite problems in 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 the church's history. Um, but there have also been. I, I mean, the church. What I, I get, the point I want to make is simply this: the church cannot be identified solely by those atrocious acts. If there are four percent of priests who have committed or an accused of committing some action over a 50-year period, well, then there are 96% of the priests who have not. And priests who are willing to die to protect the seal of the confessional are the very highest of what is good about the priesthood. And we have to, I think, as, as members of this church, in a society where the church is being attacked, and I'm going to get into that in a minute. We have to stand up. We have to defend our faith. We have to no longer be afraid to speak about things that we would rather not. Um, we've talked on this program about the abortion scandal and what's going on there. The church today is under attack. The church has been under attack for years. What are the sacraments of the church? What are those pivotal moments in our lifetimes when we have a chance to establish a real connection with God? There's only seven in the Catholic Church. We have baptism. Has that been under attack? Oh, yes, it has. Of course. Oh, yes, it has. We, it has been under attack for at least 200 years uh, you have a modern secular world which is teaching over and over there is no God. If you believe in God, you have to be against science, which is, of course, not true. Um, you have, in our lifetimes, my lifetime, countries, and still today, where atheism is the law. The USSR, for many, many years, um, mandated atheism. Communist China still to this day does that. Um, you have places like in Cuba, for example, where that's the case. So baptism, the idea, the very idea that you should believe in God, that you should be baptized into the family of God, under attack. It's under attack. The Eucharist, has that been under attack? Oh, it's been a, just recent, just within the last couple of weeks. I was reading a story. Ten churches in France were recently des uh, desecrated. Just in the last several weeks, in a two-week period in the beginning of February, ten churches attacked, desecrated, vandalized. Multiple instances of the tabernacle being invaded, ciboriums being thrown to the ground, and hosts, consecrated hosts, being strewn all around, trampled underfoot, po possibly. You don't attack a tabernacle unless you intend to attack the very heart of what is important to the believers who attend that church. The Eucharist has been under attack, just, just for that example alone. Yes. Um, <clears throat> you have the sacrament, you have the sacrament, of, do you not have the sacrament of marriage under attack? Oh, 
I mean, we can go into that for such a long time. First, there was contraception, which introduced the idea that sex did not have to be related to love, did not have to be connected to that. Then um, you had the idea, I mean, you know, we were talking in the 1960s, contraception, 1970s, a, a divorce. You, no fault divorce. There was no stigma attached to divorce. You had irreconcilable differences, fine, get divorced. Divorce is now free, it's now easy. Again, the marriage, the family being attacked by such ideas. And what else do we have? Oh, how can we forget? Abortion. Abortion. The family unit, a father, a mother, a child. Except if you don't want it. Um, and recently, oh, the very definition of marriage itself was changed by the U.S. Supreme Court. It is, not no, it is no longer simply a marriage between a man and a woman. Is marriage under attack? Marriage in the way that, that God made it. Marriage has been under attack. What about the sacrament of ordination? The sacrament under the sacrament of ordination is that under attack? Oh please, the priest scandal. So many good priests have told stories. I've heard them tell me stories about how um, they're castigated, they're ridiculed, uh, they face shame in airports simply because they wear the collar, um, verbal abuse, uh, chastisement of various natures simply because they wear the collar. Their priests are under attack. And now, another one of the sacraments, the sacrament of reconciliation. Who has not sinned? Who does not need to be reconciled to God? Will such laws really do a great deal of direct harm? Well, you may say no. You may say that... There's a, a good uh, purpose to be served here, that it's to um, make these priests uh, accountable with regard to sexual abuse, a horrendous crime. There's a, uh, a priest and a canon lawyer from Milwaukee who wrote an article that I came across in favor of this type of a law, that the church really needs to do more in the way of uh, combating this sexual abuse scandal. And if it means changing the rules of confession, so be it. Um, the idea of confessions having to be secret was something that came about in the historical um, story of the church, that it was not something that was there from the very beginning. And that may be so. Uh, but it is there, uh, but it was there, it was created for good reason. There was a reason why the church has had and held on to this for 1,500 years. There is good reason behind it. People need to be reconciled to God. Everybody's a sinner. God holds out the prospect of his merciful forgiveness. Well, what about the, and we can't, interfere with that, when civil authorities interfere with that, maybe there wouldn't be much in the way of direct consequences. In other words, maybe it's not going to prevent many people from confessing simply because they will rely on the anonymity of the confessional booth. So maybe it won't make that much difference after all. Maybe priests won't be uh, prosecuted for this type of a thing because maybe the civil authorities will never find out about it. Maybe, maybe, maybe. But there is another problem. The idea has been created. We, the idea has been created that is not safe. It's the it's ideas that are spawned that often enough uh, create the biggest problems. I mentioned the fact that you know in the 1960s we had contraception, then divorce, then abortion, things tend to roll down a hill. One idea leads to another, and so on and so forth. When abortion began, the the mantra was, you know, that we're going to make it safe, legal, but rare. Now, in New York, I think, what is, you know, what is it? 
um, you know, legal and, and horrific and often. I've been misquoting. I think Cardinal Dolan uh, had a had a phrase that he used, which I am badly misquoting. But now abortion is to the point where eight month, twenty nine day old babies can legally be aborted, and everybody's okay with this. No, that's a person. There is no basis in legitimate science that can deny that's a human person. It is well beyond the stage of viability. If allowed to exit the womb, it would live on its own. If allowed to escape, what? if we're talking about late-term abortion, we can talk about the womb as a prison if the penalty is death that comes at the end of it. If it's allowed to escape that prison of, of its mother's womb, what should be the safest place on earth, and it could live, what possible scientific explanation could there be or justification could there be to say it's not a person? And yet that's acceptable. Ideas progress. They don't stand still. We slide down hills. We start with this. We start with this where the confessional booth is uh, invaded. And how are people going to look at the confessional booth? Just knowing, okay, I haven't committed sexual abuse myself, but I know that if somebody else comes into that booth, my priest will report that to the police. Does that change the way I look at my priest? What if my idea of my priest is that he'll die first before he obeys that law? My idea of that priest is going to be he is a holy man. And the only reason he has a willingness to die to protect the sanctity of the confessional is because he cares about my salvation. My idea of that priest is going to be, I will listen to him when he speaks a homily. I will listen to him when he tells me, and I will listen to him with belief when he tells me my sins are forgiven because he's a holy man. If some priests choose to obey this law, Will not the idea that people have of priests in general somehow be tainted? Yes. We are dealing. We are dealing with um, with a very very serious subject. You know, one of the things we like to do on this on this program is to compare ideas. Compare ideas. We take a writing from Saint Saint Paul and say, okay. Does it match up with something else we know? And if it does, then it's consistent. There's more chance it's true. There's more chance, there's more reason for us to believe it. Well, how about Bishop Sheen? Bishop Sheen, um, 1900 years after St. Paul, um, but a man who had to have something right, simply because in the 1950s he had a television show that was garnering 30 million viewers a week for a 30-minute television show, is competing, going head-to-head -head with the number one people on television at the time, Dean Martin, Frank Sinatra, Milton Berle. He was number one. And when there were only three networks, he had a primetime network spot. I think it was on Tuesday nights before my time, but that's what I hear. <laughs> Anyways, um, you know, he talked about the confessional, and he said something interesting. He, he liked to use stories, and a couple of the stories he mentioned um, were these one involved King David King David and Uriah and Nathan King David apparently took a fancy to a pretty woman problem was this woman had to be married happened to be married to a man named Uriah well King David actually uh, ended up getting this woman uh, pregnant with child there needed to be some explanation for this he wanted to try to get Uriah to come home from a war and um, have relations with his wife so that his wife wouldn't have to undergo the stigma of having a, a, you know, a, a child out of wedlock. That didn't work. So then King David sent Uriah to the front lines of the war and they're thinking that maybe he would be killed, which is exactly what happened. Sometime after that, King David was visited by the prophet Nathan. And Nathan told him a horrible story. He said, there was a, a poor man who had, I think, one lamb, and this one little lamb was stealing, was stolen by by somebody who was a man of wealth, who then killed that lamb, 
to provide a feast for some of his friends. And even though this man was wealthy, he took what little this poor man had. And that justly arise, aroused the ire of King David. He said, who is this man? You bring him before me. We will invoke justice upon that man. And, and King David was upset. And Nathan turned to him and said, that man is you. You are that man. And Bishop Sheen makes the point. And I'll quote him now. He said, sometimes we can cover up our want of individual justice by a great love of social justice. Guilt is a funny thing. It doesn't go away. We may deny it. We may de deny it all, all we want. It won't go away. So what do we do with it? Well, sometimes we get self-righteous and try to find other wrongs to right. We'll right other wrongs but our own and act uh, act very proper in doing so. Sometimes that happens. Bishop Sheen had another story. This one involved somebody who's well known for, oh, being guilty of an individual wrong. His name is Judas. Bishop Sheen recalled the story where Judas was in a banquet room where a woman came with oil for Jesus' feet. And Judas said, well, why waste this precious oil in this fashion? Why not sell it and give the money to the poor? So here's Judas, now concerned with the poor in society. Um, Judas, who had, we would guess, inclinations in his heart, um, perhaps creating some inner turmoil, nonetheless becoming... Uh, righteous to the point of trying to correct Jesus to serve the interests of social justice. So after uh, becoming aware, or I actually listened to a, a talk by Bishop Sheen where he was recounting um, these stories, and after listening to that, I got a little curious. And so I looked into the background, did a little investigative reporting of my own, looked into the background of the author of this bill in California to uh, impose these penalties on these priests if they don't report secrets of the confessional. I'm not going to mention his name because we're not into doing that here, but uh, we'll just refer to him as the sponsor of the bill. And the sponsor of the bill is a man who... Uh, has gotten repeated uh, vote ratings from uh, the Planned Parenthood Affiliates of California and the California Abortion and Reproductive Rights League. And his re ratings from those two organizations has been 100%. His voting record, his stances on these issues, uh, the criteria that they use for rating people, he has satisfied the, the criteria of these organizations 100%. There is a... Uh, abortion uh, bill, where he voted yes, uh, which allowed abortions to be performed by nurses or nurse practitioners instead of doctors. He voted in favor of that bill because that would, of course, make abortion more accessible. Um, perhaps some doctors, you might, you, if you expand the, the group of people that can perform abortions, I'm sure you're going to expand the number of people who are willing to, willing to perform the abortions. Um, there's another bill and an abortion pill to make um, abortion wide medication, it's called, available, accessible on all the college universities. That's college universities. That's, I guess I just created oh, yeah. a new phrase, new term. And all colleges and universities, how's that? In the state of California, or at least publicly funded ones. Um, you know, that there is going to be now this, this new program, um, and there's going to be like a period of, uh, uh, of, of training, and they're going to ready these facilities. But then by 2022, uh, abortion pills are going to be available, just like condoms or contraceptive devices, just as easy as that, uh, to make abortion uh, available. So we have a man who um, is supporting uh, abortion at, at every instance that I found in terms of uh, votes during his tenure in the California Senate now sponsoring a bill against 
and I get, and I would say against priests. Is he doing it for what he thinks is a good motive? Um, is he really guilty of transferring, um, uh, you know, transferring some individual shame or guilt? Uh, does he have some inner sense that abortion is wrong and nevertheless his stance for it is something that he wants to work out in doing these other attacks on the church? I don't know. You can't possibly know. But as a societal um, movement, Maybe as a society that's going on to some degree. We have it in Australia. Now it's coming to California. No doubt it'll come to other places. There is justified anger. And I, there is justified anger um, or justified outrage. Let's put it this way. There's justified outrage against the horrendous acts of sexual abuse that has occurred. And people justifiably want to do something about it. That is all well and good. But it is ironic, it is more than ironic, it is tragic, that at the very same time we are so concerned about these types of things that we can have a very blind eye to something, and you can't qualify these things, you can't say, I don't know, one is worse. One thing is worse than another, but let's, let's put it this way. One thing as, just as worse, if not worse, the sin of abortion, um, we're aborting children by the millions and it's legal and it's safe and it's readily available and it's to be celebrated in New York, for example, recently. Um, and yet we can have a completely blind eye to that. How is that possible? So I say, I, I believe that the church is under attack. God is under attack. When people want to get close to God, that's under attack. So what do we do? Well, first off, I think we have to take to heart what St. Paul is talking about. I think we have to pay attention to his words, you know, plumb the depths of meaning in his words, from now on, we we regard no one according to the flesh. What is he talking about? He's talking about living um, under God, living with having put on Christ. People are spiritual beings. We have to be mindful of their souls, their spiritual lives. And when we are passing laws, or pro at least proposing laws, that don't take that into account, we need to speak up. Um, that is the reason for this program. I, I feel the need to, to speak up. Uh, just by virtue of doing this program, I'm feeling more of a... Um, I'm feeling more courage, feeling more of, of a desire uh, to speak uh, instead of just to a microphone, but face-to-face -face with other people. Um, I hope you do too. When that takes place, uh, it should always be with love and kindness. That is uh, what I would like to think is, is my goal. But while we are trying to be loving and kind to those around us, we have to keep in mind the things that are true. Is God present in the confessional booth? Is there a God? Does he love us? Does he have unbounded mercy for us? Yes, yes. Yes and yes. And when those around us, if they don't know it, if they don't at least respect our desire uh, to know it, our desire to act it out, our desire to, to live under, under those beliefs, then we have to speak out. We are defending our brothers. We are defending other souls. And... Uh, so I hope this program has been of some interest to you. I hope that we can point out things that are happening around us in our world today that maybe otherwise you might not have heard about, and that maybe, just maybe, we add a little understanding to it. This has been Ray Gerard. I want to thank my friend Jeff for being with me today and not Thanks, interrupting Ray. to correct, correct me. And 
<laughs> where am I? I might have strayed. But thank you for listening. Uh, God bless, and we hope you will be with us again next time. Thank you. We hope you enjoyed the program and will join us back for another show on WCAT Radio. This is Sebastian Mafud. Good day.